Good morning. I'm Douglas Crockford, and this is the Jason Saga. So before we go on, show of hands, who has heard of Jason? Anybody? Well, a couple of hands went up. I'm not surprised because it turns out that Jason has become the world's best loved data interchange format. And I'm going to be talking about its origin and why it is the way it is. Jason is a subset of ECMA 262, the third edition, which used to be the standard for JavaScript. It, even though it's based on JavaScript, it is language independent, so Jason works with all programming languages. So any pair of programs written in any two languages can communicate very effectively using JSON. It is text-based, it is lightweight, and it is very efficient. It is not a document format. It is not a markup language. It is not even a general serialization format. For example, JSON doesn't support directly uh, cyclical or recurring graphs. We'll talk more about that later. It doesn't support binary structures like blobs or even binary numbers. And it doesn't support functions. I've heard complaints from people who said, I want to send some JSON, but I want it to have some functions in it. I said, well, there's another language which actually does exactly that, and it's called JavaScript. So <laughs> if that's what you want to do, then use JavaScript. But uh, for communication, I don't recommend it because there are obvious security problems if you allow third-party functions to run in your environment. So I discovered JSON. I do not claim to have invented JSON because it already existed in nature. All I did was identify it and give it a name. I do not claim to be the first to discover it. There were, um, in the early 21st century, in the late, early 21st century, in the late 20th century, there were people trying to figure out how to get browsers and servers to talk together in a way which was more efficient than page replacement, which was all that the web had thought of. And so there are a lot of people who were experimenting and who had figured out that you could use JavaScript uh, data representations to move data back and forth. The earliest example of that I was able to find was in 1996, almost immediately after JavaScript was invented, people were using JavaScript to move data across the wire. <clears throat> what I did was I wrote a specification and put up a one-page website and the rest happened by itself. Literally, I, I did virtually no promotion of the thing. Whereas, in contrast, the XML community had huge players like IBM and Oracle and Microsoft and many others who were all investing heavily into that and promoting it very, very heavily and selling it very heavily. Jason was literally what I did was I put a message format in a bottle and threw it in the internet. And you discovered it and, and turned it into something, which was really amazing, a totally grassroots thing. So the influences on JSON, uh, the first one was Lisp S expressions. Probably most of you don't know Lisp, but it'd be a really good thing to learn. Uh, Lisp was developed in 1960 or late 50s. It's been around for a long time. And one of the interesting things about it is it is built on a simple data structure of simple binary trees. And it uses that data structure to represent both its structured data and its programs. So they're both made out of the same thing. And that helped me to recognize that JavaScript kind of does that a little bit as well. Uh, an another influence was Rebel, which is also a language you may not be familiar with, but is also a, a wonderful little language. It has lots of support uh, syntactically for lots of different data types. and it also contains a parsing mechanism which allows you to build uh, dialects out of those symbols. Um, one of the dialects is the programming language itself, and another possible dialect is just data. And I looked at that and thought, wow, we could do that with JavaScript as well. JavaScript, Python, and Newton script. Nobody remembers Newton script, but it, it was a big thing in the Newton for a while. Anybody remember the Newton? Yeah, the old timers go, yeah, I remember <laughs> Newton, sure. Um, all three of these languages were designed about the same time, and the inventors weren't aware of each other, but they all put the same notation in it for creating objects with fields and properties and, and arrays and stuff. So 
that you had that spontaneous invention in multiple places, I think, is indication that this is sort of a natural thing that was going to happen inevitably. So my story with Jason starts in April 2001 in a shed behind Chip Morningstar's house. Chip and I had just started a company called, at that time, Vail Networks. And our goal was to build a platform for what we now call single page web applications. We were doing that in 2001. And so one of the things you need to be able to do is to move data back and forth over the network without replacing pages. And there was a way to do that in Internet Explorer called XML HTTP request. Anybody remember that? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that would work. You could put a message in it and send it to the server. The problem was that it didn't work on Netscape. And Netscape Navigator 4 was the dominant browser at the time. And we didn't want to be launching a framework that couldn't work with the most popular browser. So we needed to figure out another way to move stuff over the wire. And the th crazy thing I came up with was using a hidden frame that we could post stuff into that would deliver the data. So this is what the very first JSON message looked like. And uh, the, the, the way it worked was we, had, we embedded it in an HTML document okay, inside of a script tag. The first thing the script did was set the document.domain to fudco.com. Fudco was and still is the name of Chip's personal server. Then we would call the session or the receive method of the session object, which lives in the outermost frame. And it would receive the message. In this case, the message is addressed to the session. So the session could dispatch that message to another object, but in this case it's going to handle it itself. It's going to execute its test method and the text it's going to consume is hello world. Now at that time we had no idea how important this was going to be. So I could I spent no time thinking about what the text was. I probably should have said something like what hath God wrought? Uh, that's been a popular one or Mr. Watson come here, I need you. I, you know, that, that would have been pretty good too, but um, I, I did this, which is very embarrassing. But even more embarrassing, I'd like to tell you that this worked, but it didn't, it failed. And it failed because we got a syntax error on the word do. And the reason that's a syntax error is because in ES3, that was a reserved word and you were not allowed to use that in an object literal. So this is the set of reserved words that are in ES3. And it's a huge list, and it includes do. And because it did that, we got an error. So once we figured out why it failed, I gave Chip this list. He put it in his JSON uh, encoder so that he would wrap one of any of these words if they occurred in quotes. And that way, they get through, and it's not a syntax error. So having done that, we were then happy and continued in our work. Now we anticipated eventually we were going to stop doing that hidden frame trick and just send the text immediately. And so we decided we needed to give the format a name. And after spending maybe 10 seconds thinking about it, we called it Jismal. But it turns out there's a Java thing that's also called Jismal. And <laughs> who would fight over this name? Um, so, so we said, okay, they can have it. And we spent a couple more seconds thinking and we came up with JavaScript object notation. And go, okay, no, nobody else seems to want that one. So we were good. So on we went. And we found it was really useful. It, it, it did a brilliant job of the thing that it was originally intended to do, um, browser server communication. But we also used it for inter-server communication because we had lots of different flavors of servers and they were all talking to each other in this JSON format. We wrote our configuration files using JSON and we implemented the world's first JSON database. So we could do it with persistent stuff. So we started explaining this to our prospective customers and some of them said, well, we've never heard of this. And of course they'd never heard of it because we just made it up, but they couldn't use it if, if they hadn't heard of it. Um, some said, oh, sorry, we just committed to XML. Eh, you know, if you just 
talked to us last week, you know, maybe we could, maybe we can't. And some said, oh, we can't adopt that because it's not a standard. I said, well, it is a standard. It's a proper subset of ECMA 262. And they said, that's not a standard. <laughs> so I said, okay, I need to become a standards body. So I became a standards body. I, <laughs> I bought json.org and I put up a website which described it and now it's a standard. <laughs> That's how it happened. Um, so in the process of formalizing it and becoming a standard, there were some things I had to formalize. Up until that point, JSON was just a gentleman's agreement between me and Chip and JavaScript but now I had to be much more specific about what is this and what isn't it. And so my design principles in putting that together were that it be minimal, I'm trying to make it as small and simple as possible, that it be textual, that it's just text and nothing else, and a subset of JavaScript. That last one turned out to be really useful because there are lots of things that you can imagine putting into a format, but they go, well, JavaScript doesn't have that, so, oh, okay. so that really helped in keeping the thing from getting bloated. I also intended it for it to be free and unencumbered. So I did not seek any patents or trademarks or copyrights on any of the JSON material. I wanted everything to be free as possible for everybody so that you could just adopt it and not have to make a deal with me. There'd be no protocol tax, there'd be no licensing fees, just everybody use it. And the reason I did that was I wanted to use it. And there were all these people telling me I can't use it unless it's a standard. So I say, okay, let's pretend it's a standard, and on we go. So in writing the standard, there was one bit of nastiness in JavaScript that I had to deal with, and that was that reserved word policy that you remember. Um, so at the time, I was trying to convince people that you can write serious applications in JavaScript, which was a really hard sell because JavaScript at that time was the world's most hated programming language. It had no respect from anybody, including the people who were writing it. You know, and so trying to convince companies that they should invest in this silly language that they could actually get work done and have it be of a quality, that was a really hard sell in 2001, 2002. And then we had to deal with this. So I could put this list in the spec which says, and if a key happens to be one of these, you have to put quote marks around it. And someone reading the spec would say, this is the stupidest thing I ever saw. Why is that? And the answer is because JavaScript. And at that moment, I was, I was trying to make JavaScript look good. I was not wanting to point out some of the really bad things in the language. So I decided, let's just quote everything. All the keys have to be quoted. We never have to show anybody this list. We don't have to explain why the keys are quoted. And it turned out in retrospect, that was a really smart thing to do because since Unicode became really popular, the question of what is a letter has gotten really complicated and it's constantly changing as they find new language, languages to incorporate. So having a, a standard which says, well, you can have a sequence of letters and digits, what does that even mean? Um, but instead we say, and you have something in quotes, and whatever you want to put in the quotes, we don't care. That works, and it's really simple, and it's timeless. It's never going to change, never going to be invalidated. So that's why the property names are quoted. Chip was really unhappy with that, because he had gotten used to the way the names looked without the quotes, and so he, and he said, I'm, not, I'm still going to do it that way. I said, that's fine, but in your released software, at least put in a switch so people can put it into compliance mode, which being the gentleman that he is, he, he did. So I, I wrote the single page website and I specified the JSON grammar three ways, first in informal English, then in railroad diagrams, and then in McKeeman form grammar. And my assumption was everybody who cared about this should be able to understand at least one of those. And if you could understand, <laughs> if you can understand two or more of them, then you've got a really deep understanding of the grammar. And in fact, it worked. We've had virtually no interoperability problems with JSON, at least none that I was ever informed of. So that worked really, really well. 
because the specification was only one page, it, there wasn't a lot of work to translate it. And so a number of very kind people all over the world volunteered translations of that page. And they're all available now on the JSON.org site, which is lovely, right? You know, you don't see volunteers wanting to translate the XML spec. <laughs> that's a bit of work. But this is pretty easy, and it's something someone could do in a few minutes, and, and it's great. If you happen to be fluent in a language which isn't on this list and you'd like to help out, you know, just send it to jason at jason.org, and I'd be happy to add it to the website. We weren't the only people who were uh, discontented with XML. It turned out there were lots of proposals for alternatives to XML. There are a lot of people who found problems with it. And one of the most successful was something called YAML, which stands for, I think, yet another markup language. And YAML's goal was to make something that was more human readable, which was not a very high bar, but, but they succeeded. And YAML's a, a very nice format. It turned out accidentally that there is a subset of YAML, which is JSON except that there were a few things in JSON which were not in YAML which kind of broke that. So usually when you see two standards which are very similar and they go, whoa, they start diverging in order to try to protect their territory, we didn't, we instead went into alignment. So a couple things were modified in YAML and on the JSON side, originally I'd specified single quote strings as an option which violated the minimal principle because there is no reason to have minimal or single quote strings. And YAML didn't like them. They used single quote to mean something completely different. So I took those out. And comments. So it turned out I should not have put comments in in the first place because we were talking about moving data between things on a network. It's going to be read by programs that are going to ignore it. So it's just waste. Right? It's just slowing everything down. Worse than that, I saw people who were starting to put decoding parameters in the comments, which would have totally broken the interoperability thing that we were working for. So I got rid of the comments. I then wrote an RFC for IETF for the purpose of obtaining a mine type. Yeah. It's just me. I could do anything I want. And at, and at some point, I, I decided, we're done. The, the best standards organization I've ever heard. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have to say, you are a very perceptive gentleman. Uh, so I, I, I filed this, uh, uh, this RFC request for comment, which is how the internet is built on, on these things. They're treated like standards, but they're written as requests. It's kind of a, a weird system, but it, it works. It's built the, the, the world. And I was hoping to get for you text slash JSON, because text is short and nice. And they did not understand it. And they said, no, you can't do that. It's application slash JSON, which doesn't make sense, because JSON is not an application. It's a text format that applications can use, just as they could use any other text. So, sorry, I, I was really hoping that I could do better for you. But now that JSON has become so popular, I would suggest that somebody go back to IETF and say, JSON should be a top-level MIME type. So we could then have things like JSON slash time, or JSON slash geo, or JSON slash money, you know, so that we could specify these things very compactly. Just saying. So um, this is a graph of interest from Google. Google interest. You can go to uh, Google Trends and type in JSON comma XML, and you will get this graph. And this shows some interesting things. That it, their data only goes back to 2004, but, but it's still useful. So in 2004, you can see the world has begun to lose interest in XML. And we see it declining. You know the I haven't computed what the half-life of XML is, but it, it's not very long. It's been dying out. And JSON starts off as just a little single-page website. 
but gradually people start noticing it and it just this linear ramp just keeps going up and up and up. So that now JSON, according to Google, is more interesting than XML, uh, which is cool. When, and XML it is two things. It's, it's a, a lousy data interchange format, but it's also a lousy document format. You know, it, it has two roles. JSON is still more popular. So that, that's interesting to me. So how does JSON work? You know, what does JSON do? JSON does two things. It's an application of graph theory and syntax, and that's all JSON is. So let's talk about graph theory. Graph theory is a branch of mathematics that was discovered by Euler, as most branches of mathematics are. Uh, he, uh, he was working, oh, I gotta laugh, thank you, I, I appreciate that, a mathematician in the audience. Um, so he, he had things which he called vertices, and he connected them with things he called edges. So you, you could have a graph of, of interesting things and show relations, and those edges are non-directional. All they mean is that these two things are connected. And graph theory for a long time was just recreational mathematics. It didn't have serious applications until computer science. And with computer science, this stuff suddenly becomes really interesting because the vertices turn into nodes and the edges turn into links and arcs, which are usually implemented with pointers. What was, what was that? <laughs> uh, and they're usually one-dimensional because they're implemented with pointers. If you want a two-dimensional link, then usually we'll put a pointer in each node and so they can point at each other, like a doubly linked list. So within graphs, there are two flavors. There are general graphs and trees. And trees are less powerful, but we really like them. There's a lot of stuff that we can do with trees. So with graphs, all nodes can have zero or more incoming links. With trees, all non-root nodes have exactly one incoming link. In graphs and trees, all nodes can have zero or more outgoing links. JSON doesn't like graphs, although it can do them. If you do some meta-processing on some data, you actually can represent a graph. But JSON really loves trees. And it turns out trees are hierarch hierarchical structures, and we do a lot of that in programming. We do a lot of it in representation of data, and JSON is really, really good at that. And then JSON is syntax. It is a grammar for expressing trees as text, and that's all it is. JSON has some types, but it doesn't describe what those types are or what anything means. It just says if you're going to write something, it's going to look like this. So JSON is built on a small set of values, strings, numbers, objects, arrays, and the constants true, false, and null. Now in retrospect, I probably should not have included null because we really don't need it, but computer scientists really love null. And so, you know, anticipating that there might be some use for it, I left it in. But I did not specify what it means. There's no formal meaning for what null represents, but Generally, everybody has an idea of what it is, and, and that's sufficient. So I talked earlier about the railroad diagrams. This is an example of a railroad diagram, where you start at one end and you drive your train on any of the tracks, and there are uh, switches where you can move from one track to another, and anything that you roll over becomes part of a message. So the value is pretty easy. It just means you're going to get one of those. A string starts with double quotes and ends with double quotes and can contain any character that is not double quotes or a backslash or uh, a control character, or it can contain a backslash followed by one of the escaped characters. And you can have as many of those as you want or zero if you take the top track. So uh, the, the one thing which is a little peculiar here is you can backslash slash, which the Unicode standard calls solidus, which I think is a great name for a slash. And the reason I did that was going back to the early frame including uh, script tag thing that we were doing. If someone had a, a string that contained 
angle bracket slash, then the HTML parser would stop at that point and JavaScript would not get the rest of the message and so that would lead to a syntax error. So to circumvent that, we allowed you to say angle bracket backslash slash and that would get through and it would mean the same thing. Uh, this is the uh, railroad diagram for a number. It looks a lot like a trumpet. It comes out there. Um, and I now see that I made some mistakes in, in following the minimal uh, principle here. I've got two flavors of E. Shouldn't have done that. I should have just said it's a lowercase e and that's it. There's, that's the minimal thing to do. And I also allowed a plus sign here on, on the exponent. Don't need that either. That, that's completely superfluous. I should have left that out. It turns out being a strict minimalist is really, really hard. <laughs> um, I got the object right though. The object is really simple. It's just uh, string value pairs. And the array is even simpler. I really like how the array turned out. So why does JSON work? Um, JSON works because it's at the intersection of all programming languages. There have been earlier data formats that took a different approach. Some tried to solve the union problem. That you look at all of the union, at the union of all of the types that are known to all languages and find a way of describing each of those, give each a name. And then a receiver of a message will get all of this data tagged with all these types, some of which it may not know, but it has to know. It has to figure out how to conform to whatever it gets sent. And that turns out to be really complicated. Then there's the approach that XML took was, which was, we don't know anything about what computers do. There's this document thing and we're gonna represent everything as you would in a document, but it really doesn't make any sense in programming. Uh, what JSON does is, play the intersection. What is it which is common to all programming languages and how can we use that common understanding in order to facilitate communication? So JSON's simple values are the same as used in programming languages. So no restructuring is required. JSON structures look like the conventional programming structures. Uh, uh, you know, every language has numbers. We all, languages can disagree on what a number is you know, is it made out of bits? Is it made out of trits? How many bits are allocated? How is the sign bit allocated? All of those things could change. Jason doesn't care. Jason says, can we agree on some digits? You know, yeah, we, we can all agree on digits. That's enough. If we can agree on digits, we can exchange numbers. It does a similar thing with strings. Jason's object is in various languages called a record or a struct or an object or a dictionary or a hash or an associative array, or in some very rude languages, a dict. Uh, JSON's array is called an array or a vector or a sequence or a list, doesn't matter. We can all agree on, we've got a thing that starts with brackets and it's got things in the middle separated by commas. Can we agree that we can make sense out of that? Yeah, that's a universal idea. All languages can make sense out of that. So, um, XML promoted this idea that if you have a schema, applications are free of having to delegate. And I think that was a seriously bad idea. It is responsibility of every application to validate its inputs. This cannot be delegated. Being well-formed and valid is not the same as being correct and relevant. That um, conforming to a schema doesn't tell you if the values are reasonable. Only the application can know that. The application cannot delegate that piece of work. So one of the best things I did with JSON was I made it versionless. There is no version number on JSON, which means there is no possibility now of changing it without breaking it. And as a result, it's very stable. So in, in most standards, it'll come out with 1.0, then 1.1, and then 1.2, and then 2.0, and everything is crap until it's 3.0, right? Not with this one. There's no number that you can't change it. Now, there are lots of proposals for things that could be added to it. Uh, but, you know, look at it this way. You, you've got this increasingly complicated network stack, right? You've got all these things. And somewhere in the middle, there's the JSON layer. 
And you can expect everything else is going to be changing over time, and that's a hassle, and there's the risk of breakage and security problems and all of that. But the JSON layer will never change. You can rely on that. And that means there's at least one part of the stack which is reliable, which will always work the way it does right now. I can't think of any feature that we could add which is more valuable than that. So um, one of my principles was minimalism. The theory was the less we need to agree on, the easier it is to interoperate. Uh, there's a tendency in standards organizations to not do this. Um, you know, if, if you've got two parties who are trying to get something into a standard and they disagree on the approach, most often what will happen is they'll either agree to leave it underspecified, so the standard really doesn't contain enough information to make it work, or they will agree to disagree putting both into the standard. So you can do it this way or that way, which makes the standard much more complex and much harder to conform with because it means as a receiver, you have to be able to, to deal with A and B. So everything gets more complex. There's more testing required. It's just harder. Whereas I took the opposite approach. I want to get this thing as small as possible. So I don't think it's necessary that every standard be able to fit on the back of a business card. But this one does. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, so I, I, would, I don't think everybody should have to be th that minimal. But it's nice that some things can. So there's some bad practices I've seen in the use of JSON. So for the most part, I've kept completely silent on this stuff. I'm not the JSON police. I've never gone out you know, scolding people for not using it the way I thought they should use it. You know, you're all free to make whatever sense you want out of it and, and use it as well as you can. I think that's great. But there are some, a couple of things that I've been seeing which I think are actually making it unnecessarily difficult for people. And so I offer this as friendly advice rather than as condemnation. In XML, there's a confusion between attributes and elements. And programmers have always struggled with that. Do I represent something as an attribute or an element? And there are arguments for either, and neither of the arguments is good. And so when you have those sorts of things, people just argue about it. And that makes interoperability harder, and it just makes everything harder. JSON doesn't have that. It just has names associated with values, and that, which is the correct answer. That is the way you want to do it. But I see people who are coming from this XML dilemma, and instead of realizing we're free, we can now do it right, you see them still holding on to the misconceptions of the earlier format in the form of at signs in their property names. Completely superfluous. The only reason that's there is to remind them of how awful it was when they were doing XML. You know, Jason can do that, it doesn't mind, it doesn't care, but you really don't need to be doing that. You can adopt the thing which is more like a programming language and just move on. I also see a lot of this. So uh, XML is really awful at representing name value pairs. And so you, you see structures where you've got a, a bracket name and followed by a bracket value and I, people will translate that directly into JSON. And again, JSON doesn't care. You can do that if you want. But JSON is really good at name value pairs. So you can just write it like that. So you get something which is much easier to use as well. It, you know, if you want to ask for what is the height in this one, you have to search for the object that contains a, a, a name property that is height and then ask what is the value of that. And this one, you just say dot height. Just so much easier. You know, the, the model in XML it was, it was different in, in, in perspective. So in XML, the idea was that you were going to discover a, an artifact on the net. And then you're going to bring it in, and you're going to analyze the artifact and try to figure out what it means. Whereas JSON, the idea was, we're going to have a conversation. We've got a dialogue between two machines, and so they already understand the context, we just need to move the data back and forth. And so as a result, we get a much simpler programming model. So when I put up 
the json.org website, I decided it needed a logo because people are much more likely to, to accept a standard if it has a logo. <laughs> and uh, I designed this thing. I was inspired by the impossible torus, which is a famous optical illusion. You can go to uh, Mathematica, or yeah, mathematica.com. I think they've got a description of this. It's related to the ambihelical hex nut, which is a, a similar illusion. Uh, so I, I took the impossible torus and I made it circular and gave it dramatic lighting. And I thought that's pretty good. And I also liked that um, if you look at it as a two dimensional structure, it's made of two identical pieces, which are just kind of one of them's rotated and they're stuck together. And for me, that represented the dialogue, the conversation between the two things, the going back and forth. And it also seems to have letter forms hidden in it. You know, there looks like there's a J, yeah, and maybe an N, and obviously an O. And I've been told there's an S in there somewhere. I still have trouble seeing it, but there might be an S. So it, it, it might actually be descriptive of the thing. Um, and for a long time, I, I thought it was an impossible thing. I thought it was an illusion, but it turns out it's real. This is a real thing. What it is, is it's a square that's extruded around a circle, but as it rotates, it does half a rotation. So it's not impossible. It's a square in a circle with a twist, which I think is a, a really nice metaphor for, for how this arrived. And I thought this was a completely original piece of work. And it turns out I was wrong because when I was five years old, my parents took me to the drive-in. Well, they took me along to the drive-in. They didn't intend for me to see Vertigo. It's not, not a show for five-year-olds. Um, and I don't, Anybody remember drive-ins? Yeah, the old timers again. Yeah, so it was like a movie theater, except it was all outside, and you, you didn't have to get out of your car. So you would park your car next to a post that had a speaker on a cord in it. And so you'd pull, open your window, and you'd pull the speaker in, and you'd hang it on the, the side of the door, and that's how you would hear the movie. And then there's a big screen that you'd watch through the windshield. This sounds ridiculous, but we used to do this. And it had a little dial on it that would control the volume. And I was really disappointed that it couldn't also turn the channel. Because <laughs> I really didn't like what we were watching and you know, wanted to watch something else. But you couldn't do that. But the title sequence of this movie was amazing. It was designed by Saul Bass, who's one of the greatest graphic designers of all time, working with John Whitney, who was the first computer artist. He was working with a... Uh, a war surplus uh, gun site, which he had modified into an animation stand. He made the first computer graphics that were ever seen in a motion picture. It was what we now call analog computing, but it was computing, and it was really interesting stuff. So at the beginning of the movie, uh, we have a, an extreme close-up of a woman's face, and then they push into her eye, and the, we see in her eye the Jason logo. <laughs> and meanwhile, titles are floating above and below, but that's on the screen, and it's there for a while, and then it pushes into her eye, so we're now in her mind, okay? And we're floating through this bizarre dreamscape of these abstract images, and the Jason logo keeps reappearing. And, and while it's all going, uh, Bernard Herrmann's score, which is just brilliant. It, it's this wonderful, uh, I, I think this may have inspired the 2001 Stargate. It's just, it's much simpler than what Kubrick did, but it's just brilliant. And yeah, it keeps showing up. It's just wonderful. So, you know, I, I discovered this many years later and realized I didn't invent this at all. You know, Whitney and Bass did this, and Bass must have really liked this because he kept reusing that image several times throughout the sequence. So this isn't as original as, as I thought it was, um, but I think it's still really good. And, and it might not even have been original with Bass because um, there are these things. Uh, you know, so there's that. So one thing that I didn't do in Jason 
was I, I didn't specify how the numbers were interpreted, how to implement the numbers. Um, in particular, I did not specify that we had to use the, IE, or the IEEE 754 floating point standard because I think it's an awful standard. And, and the worst thing about it is that you cannot accurately represent the decimal numbers. If you type that in in JavaScript or in Java or almost any language that's been designed in the last 40 years, you think you're getting 0.1, but you're actually getting this number, which is close, but it is not 0.1. And as a consequence, 0.1 plus 0.2 is not equal to 0.3. I'll talk about that a lot in the next hour. I think this is really important. And I didn't want to bake this stupidity into JSON. So all JSON says is, it's a string of digits and make the best sense you can out of it, which means that if we ever decide to adopt a better number standard which can add 30 cents together correctly, uh, we can. And we can have languages which want to do it the wrong way communicate easily with languages that do it the right way and JSON will act as the bridge to get us to the promised land. Um, so I did not intend for JSON to be the last data format. It was designed to solve a very specific problem and it did that really, really well. But there are problems that it doesn't solve and so I can imagine that people will want to do other things and I encourage that. I'm not threatened by that at all. I, I, I like progress a lot. But I have some advice for anyone who might want to do that, especially if it might be one of you. So first off, please don't break JSON. Um, you can start with JSON as, as a thing to build on, but don't try to change JSON itself. Because again, it's versionless. If you make any change at all to JSON, it, you'll break it and a lot of stuff will no longer work. And that, that's not a good thing to do. Make a new thing instead. And if you do make a new thing, make it significantly better. I've seen a lot of proposals where they want to take JSON and just add one little thing to it. And what that does is it creates an incompatibility tax because now interoperating with this thing becomes harder and so you want to make sure that whatever you're adding to it provides enough value to justify that cost. You know, so don't do little trivial cosmetic stuff. Do something that's big and meaningful and valuable. And then finally, give it a better name. I've seen a lot of proposals for JSON with a letter in front of it or behind it or a digit or punctuation or whatever. The most important thing I think that programmers do is we make up names for things. That, that's a lot of our craft is we're constantly making up names for things. So if you want to make a new standard, that's great. Show how brilliant you are by giving it a better name because the worst thing about JSON by far is the name. For one thing, nobody knows how it's pronounced. I've been saying Jason, and I, I, I hear from guys all the time who happen to be named Jason. Is Jason here? Are you here, Jason? Oh, good. So um, if he were here, I would say, I'm really sorry. You know, because Jason's in the office and he hears someone talking about Jason. He goes, what? You know, it's hugely distracting and annoying, and I'm really sorry, I understand. Um, there are other people who say JSON, and that's just fine. I don't have any problem with that all, at all. It turns out the correct pronunciation is Jason. <laughs> Everybody, Jason. <laughs> then there's a problem of what it stands for. So what it stands for is JavaScript object notation. So right away, the word JavaScript is confusing, right? Because there's the Java JavaScript thing. People are still running around. That was an intentional act of confusion by, by Netscape, and we're still suffering for that. But even if you don't know what JavaScript is, it's confusing. There's some people who think this is just a JavaScript thing, and it's not. It's a universal thing. Uh, my intention was to honor JavaScript by giving credit for where the idea came from, at that time, I was not trying to jump on JavaScript's coattails because, again, it was the most hated language in the world. So associating ourselves with JavaScript wasn't winning any friends. I was just trying to be honest and say, you know, where does this come from? 
but it confuses people. Like there are some people who think that the JavaScript standard defines what JSON is. Well, it turns out there isn't even a JavaScript standard. It's called the ECMAScript standard, and it doesn't define this. There is a JSON standard, which is ECMA 404, which is what defines this. So a whole lot of unnecessary confusion in that. Then the word object is confusing. Object describes what JavaScript thinks an object is, which is just an informal collection of name value pairs. But there are other languages where that is not an object. Objects are a very specific thing. It's a brittle thing, which is an instance of a class, different concept, and that confused people. So that, that's not good either. Notation, I don't have a problem with notation. So if you want to call your thing a notation, knock yourself out. I think that's great. So that brings us to the end of our voyage. Um, if you'd like to know more about JSON or everything else, uh, check out my new book, How JavaScript Works. Thank you. Okay, so we have 15 minutes for questions and answers. I'd be happy to answer any question if, if you should have one. Yes? That's a really good question. He's asked, if, have I ever considered, you know, if I could go back in time and give it a better name, what would I have called it? And I haven't. I, I, that would make me crazy, I think. <laughs> and so I've decided not to do that. Yes? Yeah, so those at home didn't hear what he said, and I'm not going to repeat it because it was really long. Uh, but. The, the key part of his question was, uh, what do I think about schemas and, and what about that with JSON, that uh, the XML community found some benefit in having schemas. So one of the very first things I did when I formalized JSON was I wrote a schema language to go along with it. And I never used it. I, um, I just didn't need it. So I never published it. And I've seen other people go through that same exercise. Um, I have no objection to anybody doing a schema. If a schema makes life better in any way, go ahead and do one. And there are a number of JSON schemas out there. Just pick the one that looks like it does the best for you. But in my experience, the, the greatest benefit of a JSON schema is it helps calm down the XML guys who are having to, to convert to JSON. <laughs> Once you get past that and you get in, yeah, then, yeah, we keep going. That the validation that an application is required to do anyway, that generally makes it work. And most of the problems you're going to have are going to be in the raw syntax, and JSON covers you really well there. A really good question. Yeah. Any particular reason you omitted um, arbitrary uh, radix numbers like uh, binary, optimal, x? Yeah, any reason why I, I didn't include arbitrary radix numbers. At that time, the only radix trick was hex in JavaScript. It didn't have binary or octal or, or the others. Well, it had an octal, but it was appallingly bad, and I didn't want to put that in the standard. Um, so it didn't need them. You know, if it's a number, we can represent it in decimal, whereas if you represent something in hex, it's not always clear what that represents, right? You can write a floating point number in hex, and there's a field in it that indicates the, the mantissa and, and the exponent. And I didn't want to mess with any of that. So I said, let's just keep it simple, minimal. Any number we want to communicate, we can do in decimal, and that's enough. Yes? Th that's a really good question. So what do I think about the evolution of JSON or its replacement? I expect there will be a replacement someday that someone will figure out how to add enough value to make it worth calling it a new thing. Uh, JSON itself will not evolve. It's going to be the way it is now till the end of time, and I think that's great. So, you know, eventually it's going to fade away, um, and I hope to be there when it does, but um, it, I, I, I'm expecting JSON's going to survive me by quite a lot. Um, and people have asked me a similar question about XML. You know, do I think XML is going to die? And no, I don't think XML is going to die because once something gets into an, uh, the enterprise, 
it takes forever to get rid of it. You know, there are still shops that are running COBOL. You know, so, you know, it, it's, it's going to be around for a long, long time. It's just becoming less and less and less interesting. Yes? Uh, let's see, there are two questions. What, what do I see as being the next replacement and what's the greatest shortcoming? Um, yeah. So, uh, the, maybe uh, dates. There were some people who wanted to have some explicit support for dates. In practice, I, I don't think that's a real problem. My recommendation is use strings wrapped around ISO dates. And, it, and I've shown lots of examples where you can have a, a, a function that's attached to a, a decoder which will automatically find those things and turn them into the local date objects. I've seen some people try to work around that by putting new date in the JSON message, which is appalling, that's awful. And they've asked to have that put into the standard and there's no way we're gonna do anything that language specific in this standard, it just doesn't make sense. As far as what's going to replace JSON, I, I don't know. The, the thing which is missing from JSON that I, I wish I had figured out a way to do, but I couldn't because it violated my own rules, was support for graphs. If, 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 but most applications don't use graphs. Trees are good enough for almost everything. And so, unless you're in computer science and you're doing a lot of graph stuff, that's not gonna make a lot of difference. Oh, yeah, really good question. So um, we're at a, a meeting. I don't think it was even a TC39 meeting, but Brendan Ike and I happened to be at the same place at the same time. And I'd proposed that we add this JSON support to the language. And so there was a break, and we were talking like, okay, so how are we going to do that? And we said, okay, let's have a global object called JSON, and we'll put a couple of methods on it. Okay, okay that makes sense. So what will we call them? And not being very smart, I said, oh, how about parse? Because we already had date.parse, so there was a tradition for that. And the other one shouldn't be to string because that doesn't make sense because the object is not being turned, the argument is being turned. And so I said stringify. And I'm sorry, that's entirely my fault. I should have called them encode and decode, which would have made perfect sense, but I didn't. But in my defense, I now see people saying stringify all the time. Like I just yesterday watched a, a, a video on YouTube about a Python guy and he said, and we stringify this. So, <laughs> um, so I accidentally introduced that word into the language and you know, that's great. We now have a verb that describes turning something into a string. So it's not entirely bad. Yes. Um, so json.org is still me, and all json.org does is, is maintain that one-page website. Um, the standard for JSON is managed by ECMA and ISO, and there is no plan on changing that specification. So it's done. JSON's done. If you want something better, make something better. Yes? Yeah, the four, yeah, ECMO 404, the, the numbering was completely coincidental. Um, the first ECMO standard was ECMO 1, right? And we just happened to be the 404th, and so we got that really cool number, which. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, he's talking about the synergy between JSON and REST. Uh, I hope we can do better. I think 
XML, or I'm sorry, HTTP is a terrible uh, session protocol. It's just awful. Um, I'd like to see a better session protocol that is inherently secure, that's built on TCP, that doesn't have all of the uh, residual problems that something based on HTTP has. Uh, I keep looking for something, haven't seen it yet. I took a shot at, at making one myself called the SAFE protocol while I was working here at, at PayPal. Unfortunately, I couldn't get traction on it and, and I lost funding and that was the end of that project. But I think that would have been really good. But I'm hoping someone else will, will finish that work or do something else that gets us past HTTP. Yes? <laughs> That's a real question. I, I think he has. <clears throat> in fact, uh, when I dropped out of TC39 after writing the, the uh, JSON standard, uh, ISO re required some modifications to the standard in order to be compatible with, with their whatever, their process. And so Chip was the editor of that. And he kept all the stuff that I had done. He didn't sneak in quoteless strings or, or anything like that. He just left it the way it is. So I, I don't like to speak for Chip. Uh, he can speak very well for himself, but I, I think he is probably tolerant of it at, at this point. Yes? Uh, strange using JSON as a database representation? Yeah, I think it's great that we have JSON in our databases now. Because um, JSON is really good at representing trees. Tables are terrible at representing trees. So there's some uh, databases, particularly relational databases are really good at representing essentially decks of cards. You know, the, the, the model we used to have in data processing was uh, unit record management. We had a card with 80 columns on it and you punch stuff into the card like an ID number and a, an account number and a date and all this stuff and all of that would be one record and you have machines that would sort them and collate them and print them out. And databases basically took that process and computerized it. And so their idea of what a record is, it's a, a bunch of fields and, and every record has the same fields and we can sort them and search them and do this stuff, but that's basically the model. And that's fine for that kind of processing. In fact, a lot of things want exactly that tool. But we find in programming, trying to force, we do a lot of stuff with trees and try to push a tree through a table mechanism, it's really inconvenient, right, and, and inefficient and all of that. JSON represents trees really well, so I think it makes sense that for some applications, that's a better choice. Just ask anyone who's done a BOM. I'm sorry? Just ask anyone who's done a BOM in a relational database. What's BLM? BLM, you know, bill of materials. It's recursive. Yeah, if you have lots of things which are composed of sub-things and they can go any level, that's really hard to do in a relational database. You have to anticipate what the maximum depth is and it's just awful. You're specifying all the stuff which really should require no specification. But representing that stuff in JSON, it's really easy. Yeah, last question. Yeah, the, there's no plan for it. I will not be the designer of the next format. Um, I've, I've made my contribution. Someone else will have to do the next one. Okay, thank you, everybody. And if you like, come back at 11 o'clock and you know, we'll do more of this stuff. <laughs>